1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18, pray for me as I preach that my voice will last. When you have a disobedient wife like mine and you're always yelling at her and giving her a hard time, tell you what, my voice. <laughs> you really don't know the suffering I, I suffer when I go home after Sundays, you know. Give me a hard time. You shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Amen. If you found it, let's stand together. We'll read some uh, scriptures and, and we'll get into the message. First Kings chapter 18. Uh, if you're not, but I'm sure you are aware that this is a wonderful chapter where Elijah uh, does battle with the prophets of Baal. We're going to go through this over the next four weeks uh, in sections. So we're not going to read all of it, but we're just going to read the portion that's suited for Tonight. So beginning in verse number 17, 1 Kings 18, 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel under Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab said unto all the children of Israel, sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. So we're going to look at this passage tonight in the start of our series through uh, this revival period. And I want you to draw your attention to verse number 18. And of course, uh, uh, Ahab says to Elijah, Aren't thou he that troubled Israel? Of course, Elijah says, Not me, buddy, but you're the one that's troubling Israel. And of course, when you think about Israel, I think of God's people. Amen. So we see here that there is trouble. So God's people are troubled. And if you look at verse number 21, when Elijah says, How long halt ye between two opinions? I see a people that's torn. A people that's torn. So we have a people that are troubled and torn. Now, you might think, how can that be for God's people to be troubled and torn? Surely God's people believe that the Lord, he is God. You know, we may not go down the same path as the people of Israel, the children of Israel here, but sometimes in our life we do end up torn between two. So we're troubled and torn. So let's have a word of prayer and you may be seated. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you now. And Lord, I know that in all reality, we cannot schedule right revival as such. But God, we can pray for it. We can plan for it. We can beg you for it. And God, we're asking on behalf of everyone here, God, we're asking that you would send revival to our hearts. We're asking that you would send revival to our homes. And we're asking that you would send revival to this house. God, that we may be a people that are on fire for you. God, that we may be greatly used in these days. God, that the fires of revival would be burning in our soul. And God, that we would be setting our own patch of turf on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that through these times, whether it's a Sunday morning or a Sunday night in particular, as we enter this revival time, God, I pray that this would be the beginning. Oh, God, I pray it will be the beginning where we would see some amazing things happen in our life from an amazing God. And so, Lord, we ask this. We're begging you. We're beseeching you. Lord, have your will and way in your life. If there are things that need revealing that are a hindrance to revival, I pray, God, that it would be revealed, that it would be confessed, and, God, that you would come in and bring revival for us. So, Lord, we ask this now in that name, which is above every name, that name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. <clears throat> well, I'm sure you're aware, as we just said, that here we have King Ahab. Now, if there's one, uh, if there's one testimony that you don't want to have, it's the testimony that King Ahab had. And he was the worst king that Israel ever had. 
Uh, besides Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who brought in the false worship, Ahab, this wicked, wicked king, just propelled that. The propensity of it just went forward. And most kings that followed him over Israel, over the people of God, remember the kingdoms divided, the kingdom to the north, which are the ten tribes of Israel. Then there's the kingdoms to the south, which center around Judah, uh, Jerusalem there. And, and more often than not, the kings of the south were good kings and the kings of the north were bad kings. Now that's not a good reputation to have. But anyway, Ahab had that reputation that he troubled Israel. I find it amazing how he says to the prophet, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And Elijah's like, It's not me, buddy, it's you. You're the one that's bringing trouble to Israel. And of course, if you know anything about Ahab, who was his wife? Anyone tell me who his wife was? Jezebel. Jezebel was the daughter of a, of a Baal priest. And so now he marries, he's married Jezebel, and uh, Jezebel, through her wicked influence, uh, uh, she's uh, helped uh, Ahab there with the worship of Baal. And of course, the, the, probably the most infamous thing that Jezebel ever did was Naboth's vineyard. You remember that? Where Ahab couldn't get his vineyard, and he goes home and has a pouting pity party, and he's just like pulled his covers over, he's facing the wall, and she comes on and says, Oh, what's the matter? What's the matter? Aren't you the king? Oh, Naboth won't give me the vineyard. So she just orchestrates this whole thing, Naboth gets killed and then guess what, the prophet comes again and he says, you know what, the dogs are going to lick your blood, this is going to happen, I mean talk about brutal, those prophets man, when they came along, they just told them how it was, I sort of think we need that today, don't you, I think we need some, we need some people that will get up and just tell it as it is, I mean there's, would you agree that we live in troubled times, I mean we're living in the very midst of trouble right now and if we're not careful the trouble that we are experiencing, we could get caught up in that and we could become torn between two. Oh, not me. It couldn't happen to me. Now, listen, if the very elect can be deceived, we could be deceived as well. So we've got to be very careful that what is taking place here doesn't take place right here. Because we may not physically build idols, but you know what? We can have idols here. We can have idols up here where no one can see it. And if we're worshipping idols, and by the way, covetousness is as idolatry. Well, we live in a place up here on the Sunshine Coast where you, where you drive around and you say, oh man, look at that house, man, I'd love a house like that, I'd love a car like that, oh, I'd love a couple of boats like that, and all this sort of stuff. And if we're not careful, we could gravitate to that, and we could build up idols in our own life. Is there anything wrong with having nice things? No, there's not. But I tell you what, more often than not, the nice things get a grab and hold of us. And we have to be careful about that. So we see here that this leader, King Ahab, has led God's people into a time of trouble through false worship, through idolatry, uh, through all this wickedness that's come along and it's affected the people of God and they're torn in two. Have you ever been torn in two? Ever been torn between two things? Not knowing whether it's this or not knowing whether it's that and it's amazing that during the week I just had this, as I was praying for different ones, just this overwhelming sensing that there's so many that's in that valley of decision. Decisions, decisions. And of course, when you're in a valley of decisions, you're torn between two, aren't you? Do I do this or do I do that? What do I do? Where do I go? What do I say? What's happening? And often that when we're going through a, a national time of trouble, which we are facing right now, we're probably on the, on the cusp of it. We're going into it. If we're not careful, we'll get caught up in the flow of that trouble and we'll become torn between two. Always remember, no matter how bad the day gets, the Lord hears still. God. Amen. We've got to remember that. So we see here, I want you to have a look at, hold your place there, would you please, and turn with me to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. And if you would like, this would be a good verse for us to memorize during this month. I want to challenge you to memorize this verse. Anyone ever done any scripture memorization for a while? School, that was, yeah, that's probably about it. Where we, oh, probably back at school. Well, you know what, let me challenge, uh, let, let's get the old grey matter going this month and let's see if we can memorise this verse because this is a very important verse. Look at Psalm 138. Look at verse number 7. He says this, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies and thy right hand shall save me. Now, I, I look at verses like that and I, and I am amazed at how applicable that the Old Testament is for where we are right now. 
Though I walk in the midst of trouble. Are we walking in the midst of trouble? Absolutely. We are walking in the very midst of trouble. And then the psalmist says this, Thou wilt revive me. Do you know what that tells me? That tells me that as Christians, as we walk in the midst of trouble, if we allow it, the trouble can zap us of our life. It, it, it can take the fervor. It can, it, it's like that bucket of cold water that, that you said this morning where you take that bucket of cold water and you throw it over the fire and you douse the fire because to revive means to bring life back again. And if we're not careful, as we walk in this, in this troubled time, if we get caught up in the trouble, if we're focused on the trouble, if we're not careful, it'll put the fire out. We become a troubled people. Now listen, let me just say this. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, we do not have to be troubled. We do not have to be troubled. So he says, though I walk in the midst of thou wilt revive me. What confidence the psalmist had. Thou wilt revive me. God is a God of revival, folks. Thou wilt revive me. Can you have that same confidence this month as we enter into this time of prayer for revival, as we, as we pray for our Sunday night services, as we encourage people to come along? Could we have the same confidence and know the surety? Thou wilt revive me. God wants to do that. Revive us in the midst of the years, he said. Psalm 85, look at this verse here. Would you go with me to Psalm 85, please? Psalm 85 and verse number 6. <clears throat> Psalm 85, verse number 6. So remember, I want you, I'm going to set you a challenge. Memorize Psalm 138, verse number 7. Brother Chris, Katie, when you're walking along that very long... Uh, what is it, this pier this week? We used to call them jetty. Jetty. Yeah. When you're walking along the jetty, when you get to the end, now I know you want to go fishing. Remember Psalm 138, verse number 7. Yeah. Take some time to memorize on that. As you're waiting for that bite, think about that verse. Thou, though I walk in the midst of the trouble, thou wilt revive me. Sister Carol, when you're going about your daily duties and you're driving around, Think about that verse. Even that first part. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive. Let the word of God become a part of you. Let the spirit of God take this verse and burn it deep within your soul. And may it bring revival to your own heart. Psalm 85 verse 6. Look at this. Wilt thou not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Wilt thou not revive us again? Again. Did you see that word? So revival is not just a one off thing. Revival is something that can come again and again and again. And revival comes from God. We see it in the two verses that we read where the psalmist has gone, Wilt thou? Who's he talking about? God himself. Only from God can come life. Only from God can come this revival. Only from God, as we look further in 1 Kings 18, only from God will that fire fall. I'm not talking about strange fire either. I'm not talking about the fire that Abinadab and the Bihu, whoever it was, offered that strange fire. I'm talking about the fire of God that comes down, that purifying fire, that fire that sets us alive for Him. That's what we need in these days. Amen. Wilt thou not revive us again? God, I need it again. Listen, we ought to be so sensitive to where we're at. And if we believe that I need revival, oh, I pray that we would just call out unto God and say, God, I need revival. Send it to my heart. Send it to my heart. Why? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Sometimes we think that the outcome of revival is the winning of souls. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But predominantly, revival are for saved people. Yeah, that's right. Isn't that what it is? Revival is for saved people. So when saved people get revived, guess what's going to be the outflow of that? The salvation of souls. You're going to have something burning deep within your soul. You're going to have something stirred up so much in you that you can't keep it and contain it in yourself. You're going to have to let it out. And revival starts with you. Look at yourself in the mirror when you get home and you're thinking about that verse. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Look at the person in the mirror because it begins with you, it begins with me. Don't think that it begins with the preacher all the time. God can use the preacher, but revival starts with you. You could bring revival to your family. 
I could bring revival to my family. I mean, we've, we've had fires recently on the coast, and, and tonight we just heard again, I drove past it, down there at Meriden Plains, that the, the place is ablaze. It only starts a spark. A spark starts a fire. All we need is a spark. Because sometimes we get that dry, don't we? And when it's dry and it's, it's barren and it's, and, and it's just like a tinderbox, and you know what God says? He starts off with that fire, that little spark, and then all of a sudden it just catches the light and it becomes a roaring fire. That's what our families need. That's what our homes need. That's what our church needs. And when this church catches on fire for God, when this church has revival, I do believe that it's going to impact people around us. Do we believe that? Absolutely. But people, God's people need to be rejoicing again. Amen. God's people need to be rejoicing again. Can I ask you a question? Think about this. Are you a rejoicing Christian? Are you a rejoicing Christian? I don't buy into the fact and so, when you've got so much going up in here and in here, you sort of roll on to different messages. You know, I, talk, I want to preach that series about shouting. Don't let the shout die out. But do you know that I don't buy into the fact that, oh, we're Australian and we're very quiet and we, we're not sort of outgoing like that and when we come, I don't buy into that. I really don't. Because it's the same Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that brought revival in America, the same Holy Spirit that brought revival to Wales or to England, isn't it the same Holy Spirit here? The same Holy Spirit that, that, that gets so excited. And let me say something, folks. When the Spirit of God stirs within you and He wants you to rejoice or He wants you to shout out, just let it happen. Yeah. But let me just say this. There's times where it's somber. There's times where there's silence. There's time. Listen, not every time is a shouting, rejoicing time. And let me also say this. If church is the only place that you can praise and shout and rejoice... You could be a show-off. Because it's outside of the house of God that counts. What do you like when you're at home alone? What do you like when you're in your car on your own and you've got, the, you've got some music playing and hopefully it's good music, godly music, where, where it stirs your soul or you've got the word of God being read on your, on your CD player or you've got some preaching going, I don't know, whatever it has. But listen, if you can shout and rejoice in private... You should be able to shout rejoice in public. Same God. Same God. So the result of revival is, is God's people rejoicing again. Do you not think in these troubled times we ought to be the most rejoicing type of people around? Despite what's going on, even if they bring in same-sex marriage, even if every school in Australia has safe schools program, even if, if, if all that wickedness comes in, and let me just say something, folks, it probably will come in, we can still rejoice because of who our God is. Amen. We're not going to let the world dictate who we are. Why, why should we let the world steal our thunder? Why should we let Satan uh, rob us of our joy? Amen? Amen. We ought to just rejoice because God is God and he is still the Lord. He's on his throne. Everything's fine. Nothing's caught God by accident. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go back to 1 Kings 18, if you would. 1 Kings 18. <coughs> I want you to notice a few things which really struck me in this last week. And it's so, so amazing as you, as you follow current events. Verse 17 and 18 again, it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. This is something that I got from this, and it's this bad leadership wants to blame Christianity. Bad leadership wants to blame Christianity. Did you see that? The prophet comes on the scene, a man of God, a child of God, a Christian, say. And what's the first thing that a, a worldly, corrupt leader of a nation said? Aren't you the one that's troubling this nation? Yeah. Isn't it you Christians that are, that are troubling this world? Isn't it you Christians that stopping people from just loving one another and all this sort of stuff? Isn't it you Christians that want to do... Listen, it's not us Christians that are doing it. It's the world that's doing it. It's bad leadership that's doing it. When I say bad leadership, professional politicians are doing it. 
it's the it's the Bill Shorten, it's the Malcolm Turnbulls, it's the it's the Christopher Pines, it's the Nick Xenophons, it's all those people that are troubling this nation because of their wickedness Amen. and what they're allowing to come into this place. They have forsaken God and they are following strange gods. That's what they're doing. So it's not the Christians that are troubling the nation. It's ungodly people that are troubling the nations. It's people that are being moved about by that spirit of wickedness, which is Satan himself. What do we want to do? We want to bring righteousness. What do we want to do? We want to help people. What do we want to do? We want the chaplains in our schools and and the RE programs in our schools to reach out to young people and say, listen, there is a hope and that hope is in Jesus Christ. That's what we want to do. We want to see it. We want to see a people saved and baptized and on their way to heaven. We don't want to see anyone go to hell, whether they're homosexual or straight or whatever it is. We want to see everybody saved. Amen. Amen. But, you know, when you have a heart to do that, corrupt people say you're the one that you're. You, listen, you're rocking the boat right here. And we better keep you quiet. We want to keep you quiet. That's what they're trying to do. They are trying to silence us. Are we going to allow ourselves to be silenced? When the state schools say, listen, Sam is being too proactive in her Christianity. And I tell you, it happens because I think it happened with Esther. It has. It happened with Esther, Zanita's child. She wasn't even allowed to have any, any Christian uh, symbols on her laptop or and something. You can't even take your Bible to school. Really. Can't take your Bible. Matt, when I got saved, I think I, so I was talking to someone this morning. It might, might have been you. When I was saved, I was still in the state school. Mate, that was the, that was the best mission field ever. Yeah. And, I could, and I mean, I didn't have a little New Testament. I didn't know any better. I took my proper Bible that I'd take. You know what I mean? Hey, just, I didn't know any better. So I got to I've got this big Bible, I'd sit there and I'd read it and I'd, I'd talk to my friends and say, hey, why don't you come to church with me? Come to church, come to church. Man, what days we had. But they're soon bringing that to a close. But will we allow this world to silence us? Will we allow this world to rob us of our joy? Will we allow this world to stop us from being a witness for Jesus? Set my soul afire, the hymn writer says. I want you to hold your place there in First Kings. Turn with me to the book of Second Timothy, if you would. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I like reading these passages because we're right here, right now. This is where we're at. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This know also, verse number 1, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Would you say that perilous times would be troubled times? For men, now listen. In the book of Kings, they they forsook God and they followed strange gods. We're going to look at a list of what what, what the Australian God is right here. The Australian God. Do you know when you go and witness to people, you've probably done it, those of us that have witnessed, people say, I've got my own religion. (laughs) They're saying they've got their own God. Do you know who that is? Them. It's them. It's their own heart. They, they tell them that they're okay. They tell themselves that everything's fine. They tell them you're on the way to heaven. They worship themselves. They are their own God. Have a look at this. Verse number two. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's interesting, isn't it? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, Without natural affection, come on, are we there or what? Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Hello? We're despised, folks. We are a despised people. Verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Oh, listen, this is the God of Australia, folks. The God of Australia is man himself. Hedonism. See that list there? That's exactly what we're facing. You know, something that stuck out for me in this list is found in verse number two, disobedient to parents. 
disobedience. I was thinking about that, and I want you to turn with me, please, to the book of Ephesians. I know we're looking at a few scriptures, but I want you to see it in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2. As I was meditating on the message this afternoon and just going over some things, as I read 2 Timothy 3 and that disobedient to parents come out, it's, it sparked something in my spirit, and, I, and, it, and, it's, and it's found here. Remember that, disobedient to parents. Look at Ephesians 2. Verse number one, he says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in all trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, look at this, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of what? Who is that spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience? The prince of the power of the air. So when we see in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 these perilous times, these troubled times, and we see disobedient to parents, do you know where Satan is most active at today? In the hearts of young people. Yes. Disobedient to parents. And he's going to get in through the younger generation. We were talking about Billy Graham just before yeah. the service. 1957, Billy Graham come out here and he held his crusades. And you can still come across people today that have a testimony that they were saved in the Billy Graham crusade. There is a generation that is moving off the scene and there is a new generation coming in that know not the God that Billy Graham knew or they didn't know the God that we know. And Satan is taking those young people, those young wives, and he's making them disobedient to parents, disobedient to authority because the parent is a picture of authority. Would you agree with that? So when we look at that, we're going to see a generation of people that are disobedient to authority and it's the prince of the power of the air that is working in those people. That's troubled times. They don't want to know God. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't witness. That doesn't mean that we, shouldn't, that we should stop doing what we're doing. But our fight is getting harder and harder. We have a troubled nation. And we have troubled Christians today who are torn between two things. God or, well, it's okay. They just love each other. It's okay as long as they stick to themselves. Surely the Lord would, surely he's okay with it. I've heard that. I've heard that. That tells me if they're saved, they're torn Listen, you can't be torn between the Lord God. He is God and you can't serve God and other gods. You know, Magda Sabansky, who's heard of Magda Sabansky? Well-known Australian actor, goes on the project, my favourite show of mine. I love it dearly. I want to wring a few necks, that's what I want to do. Do you know she got on there and she said, that growing up, that Christians are to blame for her troubles. Because she's a lesbian. And because back in the day you weren't allowed to come out the closet, should never have come out the closet, put them back in the closet, shut the door, leave it there. But because Christians wouldn't allow her or them to come out of the closet, it's the Christian's fault that I suffered so much. Does that not sound like Ahab? Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Isn't it you Christians that are troubling? Listen, take the Christians out of the scene. Do you know that we still have some people who are not saved that still don't want same-sex marriage? So we have some, uh, we've got some people out there that have some sort of moral decorum out there. But because Christians are vocal about it, we become a target. Notice the Muslims haven't been very vocal about it. Yeah, that's right. Now, I don't know whether they're just sort of staying back a little bit and seeing what happens to Christians, but their own religion is against same-sex marriage. Their own religion is that, as a matter of fact, They've got two Qurans. Did you know that? They have two Qurans. They have a Quran that is uh, for the militant and then they have a softer... Watered down. Watered down. Yeah, they've got their own watered yeah, down versions yeah. too. NIV. NIV Quran. <laughs> <laughs> the NIK. <Yeah. laughs> the New International Quran. 
In the Quran, it forbids that sort of thing. And as a matter of fact, if Sharia law was to come in, homosexuals would be stoned. Yep. Yeah. That's true. So they're just sitting back now, probably because they've copped a lot of flack through whatever it is that they've been doing. But they've been very silent about it. So this Magda Sabansky, she gets up and she's saying it's the Christian's fault. They are to blame. Now, let me just say this. Oh, doesn't that amaze you? Talk about I, I, we, We've seen this before. What do they do? They take it out of context to suit their own selves. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how easy is that to understand? We're going to go to a passage in a minute, so just hang on right there. You know, I've said this before, and I don't want to be a broken down record, but you've heard the, uh, the, gender, the fluidity of gender. Now, what they mean by that is that, is that there should be a, a, a flow, a seamless transparent flow there's no uh, there's no defining we, we've we've spoken about this before so we won't labor the point but there's this gender fluidity the only fluidity that's out there is a fluid fluidity of moral problems that's the only fluidity that's out there forget gender fluidity the fluidity that we're worried about now is that we are being troubled with a moral decay in our society and if we're not careful, we're going to get up, we're going to get caught up in the flow of this fluidity and we're going to be troubled. And if we're not careful, we get so troubled that we could be torn. It could happen to you and to me. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as gender fluidity. When I think of fluid, when I think of water, do you think of stability or instability? Is water a stable thing? No. So when, there's a, when, there's a, when there is a fluidity in society, society becomes very unstable. And that's where we are right now. But in the midst of an unstable society, we have a stable God. Aren't you glad he doesn't change? Aren't you glad that he is the same yesterday, today and forever? Aren't you glad that you're going to get up tomorrow morning unless the Lord comes back tonight? And I know there's some that's probably, hey, come on, Jesus. <laughs> But if he doesn't come back tonight, we're going to wake up tomorrow. And do you know that God is going to be just the same tomorrow as what he was today? You don't have to worry about if you wake up whether God's in a good mood or a bad mood. He's always the same. There is no instability without God. Aren't you glad about that? I want you to go with me to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter. <clears throat> I, want you to, I want us to look at the life of Lot for a minute. Now, remember, Lot is known as a righteous person, a just man, all right? He pictures a Christian. And he pictures a Christian. Now, where did Lot live? Does anyone remember? This is such a hard question. Sodom. He lived in the midst of Sodom there. And as a matter of fact, oh, anyway, I don't want to chase rabbits, but whenever I read Genesis 19 and Lot wants to give his virgin daughters to the wicked men outside... I just want to grab that guy and punch him in the head, honestly. It's like, why would you want to do that? Would you like to give Sam? Would it be like you taking Sam and saying, hey, you've got some angels here, don't worry about that. Here's my daughter, have her and throw her to the lions. So I just want to get him and say, don't, why would you do that? But anyway, it's there and that's what he did. But have a look at this. This is very interesting because I think we are living in the midst of Sodom. Would you agree with that? Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse number 6, 2 Peter 2, 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Hello! Where do we go back to? We go back to Sodom. Why? Because it's an example. Was God happy with the Sodomite? No. Is he happy with the Sodomite today? Absolutely not. Verse number seven. And delivered just, that word just means righteous lot. Now look at this, vexed. That word vexed is the same word as being troubled. He was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. So in other words, he was troubled with the wicked lifestyle. Lot never partook in the lifestyle. Lot didn't join in in their wickedness, in, their, in going after strange flesh. He didn't join in, but he was troubled with the wicked, the filthy conversation of the wicked. Now look at this. For that righteous man, 
dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Hallelujah. But do you notice that Lot didn't get caught up in their lifestyle. He was troubled because he saw and he heard. Now he should have said something about it because you know what? Lot had an important position. He sat at the gate. And sitting at the gate means it's a position of importance and power. Lot had influence, but Lot didn't use it. So Lot was troubled because he was in a society that was wicked. It was going after strange flesh and in seeing and hearing. I mean, can you imagine sitting every day and just hearing everything about the wicked lifestyle of the Sodomite people? I remember working in factories, and, and when you work in factories or transport, you, you work with some pretty hard guys, um, you know what I mean? And sometimes they'd come to work on a Monday, and they want to tell you all about their escapades on the weekend, and oh, how much money I spent on alcohol, and oh, what I did here, and what I did there, all this sort of stuff. And they say, oh, and what did you do on the weekend? Uh, went to church. But you know what? Have you ever felt troubled and dirty after sitting and hearing and seeing? I mean, going down to different places in our community, whether it's down to Brisbane or, uh, you know, uh, Fortitude Valley or wherever it is, and, and you see all that type of lifestyle going on. And it's like you've got to walk around like this sometimes. But hey, you don't have to go down to Fortitude Valley. Just walk along the beach and see the naked women that are getting around everywhere. Just go down to the supermarket and see, and, and now they're all coming out and holding hands and hugging and kissing and doing everything in our very sight. I'd say we are in a troubled world. And just like righteous light, we live in the midst of a, of a filthy society. But I pray that our influence doesn't change. And I know that God is going to deliver us one day. He's going to take us out of here. Because he knows how to deliver the righteous out of trouble. And I'm glad about that. So we've got to be very careful that we can be troubled by what we see and hear. But we don't have to let it trouble us. And because we live in a troubled society, in a troubled nation, we walk in the midst of that. We ought to be asking God for revival constantly. God revive our heart. Secondly, I want to give you this. Christians who know the Bible should not be troubled. Christians who know the Bible should not be troubled. And I, I, I'm sure that I, I stand before people tonight that know the Bible. I'm sure about that. I, I'm, I'm sure I know you all and you know the Bible. So I'm, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here. But though we're not a big church, I would say we also have a few people that really don't know their Bible. They may be new to it. Um, they, they may have been saved for a long time, but never really got into the Word and studied the Word of God. If you don't know your Bible, you will be easily troubled with what's going on. But if you know your Bible, you know that what's taking place is all part of God's plan to bring in the soon return of our King. Amen. I want you to have a look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. What a classic chapter. Magda Sabansky should have quoted this. <laughs> but she did it. What scripture did she quote? Do you know? Uh, well, there was something about how Jesus told people to love him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God is love. <laughs> yes, he is. But in his love... In his love, he's, he doesn't put up with, with that sort of stuff. It's like what we heard this morning. I know, I know that these folks we're talking about are probably not even saved. God's going to chastise those of us that are his. But what he does, he chastises us but brings judgment upon them. That's the difference, folks. Have a look at this. Romans 1, verse 21. Would you just bear with me for a minute? Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imagination and their foolish hearts were dark and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed. The first thing that you see about a society that we are in that, that brings trouble is that they want to change. Um, we want marriage to change. We want marriage redefined. 
We want to change this. We want to change that. This change is happening, but it's not for the better. So they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You know, when you think about corruptible man, let me just say this. When you think about the pit-up people for the LGBTIQ, whatever it is, it's all the rock stars and the movie stars. Corruptible man. Corruptible man. So we see it right here. Verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonour their own bodies between themselves. See, she should have quoted this. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So now we're in the New Testament and we're right here, folks. This is the day that we're living in. For this cause, God gave them up under vile affection. For their own women did change the natural use into that which is against nature's Magda Zabansky. Verse 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. It was right for them to receive the recompense of their error. That's what he's saying. It was right for them. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And you've heard me say this before. The reason why Christians are not liked is because we remind them of a holy God. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They don't, oh, let me just say this for a second. They don't want to retain the God of the Bible in what they want is their God, the God of love. He's a God of love. He's a God of this. God is for homosexuality, all this sort of stuff. They don't want to retain the God of the Bible. And what we do is we, we remind them of the God of the Bible. Verse 29, they were filled with all unrighteousness. And he goes on, look at verse number 32. Look at this. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Now, that's pretty plain right there, isn't it? Who are we talking about here? We're talking about those that change. Those that women with women, men with men, chasing strange flesh. So those that commit such things are worthy of death. Now, look at this. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So the, those that are worthy of death are those who are committing the practice, those who are committing the sin, and those who take pleasure in them doing it. Which is the majority of society in the world today. The gay and lesbian Mardi Gras is supported by a number of different organisations now. Even the Australian Defence Force. And, and, and organisations that you would be like scratching your head. And you see politicians getting out there. And you see this sort of people getting out there. And they're all dancing down the street. You know what? We ought to have a heterosexual pride day. We ought to have a God Pride Day. Amen. And we ought to walk down the street. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but I'd like... You know what I mean? I know we're not meant to be... Oh, and all this sort of stuff. But that doesn't mean that we should shut up and not, not share what we believe. Now, they may have a bigger platform than us. And they may have bigger organisations behind them. But we've got God. Amen. That's all we need. That's all we need. All we need is God. So you see that they changed the truth of God. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. They didn't want to retain the true God in their mind. And so God gave them over. And so what we're seeing is a result of that. So if we as Christians know our Bible, why do we get troubled? We shouldn't be troubled. In John 14, 1, Jesus said this, Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In John 16, 31, he said, he said this, These things have I written unto you that, that believe in me. He said, These things have I written unto you that my peace I give you. Not as the world giveth give unto you, because the world, in the world, he says, you shall have tribulation. We're going to walk in the midst of trouble. We're going to see trouble. We may even get involved in some trouble. But we still have a God who can bring revival. Matthew 24, 12 says this, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And we're there. We're there. I want to go back and I want to close with this very quickly. First Kings, let's go back to First Kings 18. 
this last point, I'll tell you now, I heard this in a message and I believe God allowed me to hear it because it fits so well here. Alright? <clears throat> Verse 17 and 18 again. You notice something here. That Elijah had to confront Ahab. Elijah had to confront Ahab. And I want you to listen to this, this point. You cannot change what you are not willing to confront. Think about that. You cannot change what you are not willing to confront. If you and I are not willing to confront, now I know that there are some things that are inevitable. I mean, there's some things that are going to happen because it's God's plan, but that doesn't mean that we don't confront it. It doesn't mean that we just go back into our little hidey hole, our cubby hole, and just hide and say, oh, Lord Jesus, come. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean we capitulate. But it means that we have a voice. And it means that we need to confront, even if it's in our own home, and we deal with it in our own home, and if we deal with it in our own church, and we confront what's happening out there, we confront it in here. But most people don't like confrontation. I don't like it, to be honest. I've had to deal with it. You can't get... You, listen, you can't be... A boss or, or even a pastor and, and not have to deal with confrontation. We see it all the time. Now let me just say this. If, if we had a, a special day and we had, we had the, uh, the LGBTIQ crowd, we had some of those people come in here, <coughs> fine. But they get what we have here. They 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 would be confronted with their sin. And they should be confronted with their sin. A fornicator should be confronted with his sin. But, you know, the, the thing is about the media today, and they, they, they give the Christian a hard time because we're against same sex. Listen, I'm against any time of wrong sexual activity. I'm against, I'm against a, 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 an Aussie, red-blooded Aussie male fornicating around the place. I'm against that. And it's, the Bible's against that. I'm against adultery. The Bible's against that. So whether it's the sin of the homosexual crowd or whether it's the sin of the heterosexual crowd, it's sin is sin. And sin has to be confronted. And if you're not willing, listen, nothing will change unless we confront it. Elijah had to confront a wicked king. Elijah had to confront the false prophets. And we have false prophets many. There's false prophets all over the place. Brian Houston, I think, is a false prophet. I'm sorry. You know, I believe he's a false prophet because he is so wishy-washy on this. He is a man that pastors one of the largest churches in the world. He has influence. He has a big platform. And he doesn't have the guts enough and, and the conviction enough to get up and say, it's wrong. And you know what it's going to be left to? It'll be left to the little churches. It'll be left to the little church pastor to get up and confront the wickedness of society and say that's wrong. That's what the prophets of old did. That's what the men of God of old did. They confronted the issue. And they brought change. You say, but pastor, we're not going to change all of that. I get that. But do you know what? We could see some people saved and changed. But if, if, and I don't know, you may be troubled by what's going on. If you are troubled by what's going on, then you have to, you have, to have the courage and the conviction to confront that in yourself. That's why we're praying for revival in our hearts. That's why we're praying for revival in our homes. We're going to have to confront some things at home because you know what? Like the spirit of uh, the, the Prince of the of that spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, he's going to come in through any, any means and he's going to use the young people. So it has to be confronted. We have to confront the false prophets. And you know what? When we confront the false prophets, that really doesn't make us popular. But I don't think Jesus was overly popular either. You know what I mean? I mean, they, cru they crucified the king of glory. They still want to. Yeah, they still want to. How arrogant of, of humanity 
To think that if when Jesus comes back, and by the way, he is coming back. Someone should tell that dude that. Listen, mate, he's coming back. And all power to you. If you think that you're going to crucify Jesus Christ again, you've got rocks in your head. He's taken us out. You're going to go through seven years of tribulation. He's going to pour out his wrath upon you. And you're going to stand before a holy God on the day of judgment. You're going to be judged out of the books and thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity. Now that's a sad end. It's a sad end and we have to confront that. But not only wickedness and false prophets, but you know sometimes God's people have to be confronted. Sometimes I'm going to have to get up here or Pastor Marshall or Brother John, whoever gets up here to preach and who preaches with conviction, sometimes we're going to tread on your toes. Not all the time, but stuff has to be confronted because you cannot change what you're not willing to confront. And aren't you glad for the Elijahs of this world? Art thou he that troubleth Israel? No, it's not me. It's you. You. He put the onus back on the king. You are the reason. You are troubling this nation. Malcolm Turnbull, you. Bill Shorten, you. And whoever else. The list is endless. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, and though there could be some troubled and torn believers, God can still revive us. We've got to believe that. Amen? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. God, I pray again as we go into this month, and I pray that through our daily routines that we would remember, remind us, Holy Spirit of God, about Psalm 138. May we memorize that, though we walk in the midst of trouble, that will revive us. Lord, as we go about our daily duties, around midday, lunchtime, and at tea time at 6 o'clock, may we bow our heads and pray for revival in our hearts, homes, and in the house of God. Lord, we're asking you for revival. We're believing you for it. We live in the midst of perilous times, troubled times, but God, we don't have to be troubled. We know that you are soon returning. But God, while we wait for your returning, I pray that you would send revival to our hearts. God, we pray that you'd bless us as we go. I pray that the message has been a help. I pray that it's been an encouragement. I pray that we'll take it into this week coming. God, that we would do our fighting on holy ground, that we would take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we would confront the things that need to be confronted on a biblical stance. God, I pray that you would help us. We may be only small in number. We may be tiny. We may be small. But God, we have a big God. We have a God who is able. And we can shout with the voice of triumph because we are victorious. So God, I pray that you would bless. I pray for Chris and Katie and the family as they head off for a holiday this week that you would bless them and give them uh, refreshing I pray for Jeff as he goes in for his operation on Tuesday, God, that you would guide the hands of the surgeons. I pray that you would bless him with that. I pray for Tech as he goes for uh, his uh, appointment on Tuesday. I pray, God, that you would be with him. I pray that you would be with Ken and for all else, Father. The marshes, God, that are not with us today, I pray, God, your blessing and help for them. God, I pray that you would add to our number. I pray that we would see people who are serious about their Christianity. I pray that we would see souls saved and, and coming into the house of God. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless this week. Use us for your glory, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, God.